let's embark on another fascinating journey. Here's Lillian Garcia. Welcome, everybody, to Chasing Glory. Welcome, everyone. It is a very emotional day today. It is 9-11. And I know every time it comes around, it, it is a day to reflect. It is a day to remember. Like they say, never, ever forget. Uh, to get started in this episode, I want to go ahead and introduce my producer, Sean Gosser, who is here with us. Hello, Lillian. Hi. So it's I, I'm actually honored to be doing this show today. It's so special. I'm an Army brat. My dad served for over 20 years, uh, retired lieutenant colonel, and we lost him on Christmas Day, which is sad. And I, I think about him a lot. Uh, I don't know what it is. I don't know whether it's because it's 9-11 and, uh, you know, leading up to 9-11, but I've been thinking a lot about him. Uh, I mean, there's not one day that goes by that, that I don't think of Dad, but for some reason, like, I'm getting so emotional. Like, I just, I walk around just missing the heck out of him. And it makes me realize, um, you know, what so many people went through 9-11 and missing their loved ones from there. Do you remember where you were? I do. And I want to get into that. Before I get into that, though, I just want to um, I want to thank Alexa Bliss, which is my guest from last week. Incredible story. I told everybody. I was like, man, this is going to be really powerful. And she got very emotional. Uh, and I was thanking her for that because, you know, we always say real, raw, and inspiring, right? Well, that's exactly what she was, real, raw, and inspiring. The tweets and the Instagram posts and the Facebook posts, my gosh, and the and the comments, you know, that came in to uh, Apple Podcast and uh, Podcast One app and everything was so incredible in how much she touched everyone. So I want to thank her for being so open and letting us into her life and her struggles. And that's what this whole thing here at Chasing Glory is. And Again, want to let you guys know you can follow me at Lillian Garcia on both Instagram and Twitter and Lillian Garcia official fan page on Facebook. And make sure that you subscribe at Apple Podcast. And, you know, it's not that I want to bring anybody down. This is not what the show is about, right? No, just like you said in the beginning, this is about remembrance. But you have to remember. You have to remember so we never go back and we understand, too, what we continue to fight for. And 9-11 was so profound for me. So I was actually, we, of all places, we're, we were, well, we were in Texas. And now I don't remember exactly the, I'm trying to think if we were in Houston. And no, we were, we were somewhere else in Texas the night before on Monday Night Raw. And this is when actually both shows, Monday Night Raw and SmackDown, you both, you worked for both. Now it's separate. You basically, you work for one or the other. But um, so I left that show, and I just remember that Chuck Palumbo and Sean Stasiak, they were both in a car together, and they asked me, I was in a car by myself, and they asked me, hey, uh, do you need a ride? And I was like, no, I actually have my car. And they were like, well, do you want us to follow you so that we can make sure? Because we're traveling like two to 300 miles an hour, and I usually traveled with Trish Stratus. But for some reason, she wasn't there, and I don't know whether... She was hurt during that time, but I, I don't remember. But anyway, so I was traveling by myself. So I was like, yeah, if you guys can follow me, that'd be awesome. So they did. And we stopped along the way, you know, um, and it was just, it was cool to have that safety thing, right? So we get to the hotel and the next morning I was awoken and now I'm in Houston now. We drove to Houston. So um, at seven something in the morning, I get a call from my ex telling me, that he goes, I'm okay. I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm just, I'm, I'm running, I'm running up to times square. And I'm like, ah, ah. like I'm trying to wake up and I'm like, eh, am I dreaming? Like, what's going on right now? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, there's just, just like this big bomb that went off in the towers. And I was on my way. He was literally on his way to a meeting at the towers. He was wow. late because of a coworker. So, and this, my ex used to always love be punctual, right? So I could just imagine he was so mad that the coworker was late. Uh, he ended up saving his life. Wow. Right? So he was like, yeah, there was something that happened at the towers. And so everybody is running up now. He'd already been at the towers. Think about it. So he was already like running towards, uh, he said, close to Times Square. Now I lose communication with him. And now I'm like, wait, what? Hello? Hello? And, and now I can't get him. All the lines are like, <sighs> nah, 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 
can't can't get them. So I turn on the TV. As I turn on the TV, all I all of a sudden I see the the the, the tower flaming. Now this is the first one, right? I see the tower flaming, and then I see uh, all of a sudden, boom! The other plane going into the second tower. I'm like freaking out. And then I see the tower going down. When I saw the tower going down, the call came in from him. And I was like screaming into the phone, telling him, it's gone. It's gone. It's down. He's like, what's gone? I said, the tower. It's completely down. And he's like, what? Now, remember, he's running. He has no information whatsoever. So he's just like. Florida. He's like, what do you mean it's down? I mean, the whole thing just fell down. Now, all of a sudden, I lose him again. I can't get him. The second tower ends up going down. I am mortified. Like, then there's all these reports on the TV that there's all these bomb threats and other places and all that. So I don't know if he's safe or if he's not. Now I know he's in Times Square. That's like, a, you know, a place you think, time, you know, for sure something might happen. So I couldn't get any of my friends. Nobody was staying at the hotel. I remember calling Ivory. I remember calling Molly Holly. I remember calling all of them. And no, everyone was staying at a, at a different hotel. Well, I remembered that because uh, Chuck Palumbo had helped me the night before. I called him up, woke him up. I told him what was happening. He ran over to uh, my room, and we were watching the news And if it really wasn't for him, I think I would have fallen apart. Like he just held me. I just cried and cried and cried. He was in shock. And I just, I couldn't get a hold, you know, of my ex. And I was just like, this is, this is just crazy what's happening. And so that whole day, I finally got a hold of him again. And he was like, he was okay. But it was just such a shocker. And then the whole day I spent with him. Like I, Chuck was my guy that I, I went and and I I tried to eat. I I was just having such a hard time. And then we were supposed to have SmackDown that day. And I remember everything got canceled, obviously. So then Vince McMahon made the decision to go ahead and start. uh, He said, let's just stay here and let's go live. Because we were going to tape the show that day, which was a Tuesday. And it was going to air Thursday. So he decided... Everybody stay. We couldn't fly anywhere, anywhere. You know, everything was shut down. So we said, let's just stay here and we'll go live on Thursday. Now, everybody think about this. In those two days, NFL canceled the shows. Every show was being canceled. And he was like, no, we're going to proceed. That's exactly what the terrorists would want. We're going. We're moving forward. The country needs this. We need this. Then he asked me to sing the national anthem. Oh, my gosh, Sean, when I tell you. That that was like, I was so proud and honored to like do that. And I was the first person to actually sing the national anthem at a open event, uh, open forum. Um, and I knew the meaning behind it. And then knowing that my ex was there and, and he almost died and, uh, you know, living in the city for, I, I lived in the city for 16 years. I love New York City. Love it. And so the emotions that are run through, so I am like honored and everything at the same time. I'm like, how am I going to get through this? I, the voice is one of those things. You cannot hide the emotion. You can't. And then the way they set it up too. If you guys get to Google this uh, on YouTube, you have to see this. The way that Vince McMahon, first of all, comes out and he gives this amazing speech and just really rallied everybody in the audience and everyone had their posters and their banners and their flags and you know all of this and it was something the country just needed 16 years ago i can't believe it just 16 years ago today so uh actually yeah on the on the 13th so two days after but i i just remember that after that he left the ring and then all the superstars came out and lined up along the ramp and it wasn't just the superstars. It was everybody who worked backstage at WWE and just everybody lined up the ramp and everyone just came together. And then I was a little old me in the middle of the ring. Uh, I was trying to pull together a little outfit that I represented. You know, I remember having the red shirt with the, the white skirt. And then I had this little band around my neck that was blue. I was trying to, like, figure out a way to to, to represent America, right? 
and then sing in the national anthem. And during that time, I used to sing it completely a cappella. It was later that we added music to change it up. But, um, man, that was crazy. Uh, and then the to this day, people tell me they listen to it and they, they get goosebumps and just everything that was going through. And, no, you know what? Not every note was perfect, and that's not what it was about. I was just so emotional. I couldn't even hardly. Land of the Free really got me. You'll hear it. And it was just so pure, though, of, of just emo- raw emotion that um, I'm just grateful that I got through it. And, in fact, we talked about it, and we're going to air it at the end of the show here today. <sighs> wow. It's just insane. I can't even imagine what these families went through, though. And then having lost all these, you know, soldiers uh, to the wars that we've been to in Iraq and Afghanistan. And And people that are still over there 16 years later. Look, I don't care whether you're for it and you don't think or against it or whatever. I mean, just I love the fact, though, that people respect the military because my dad didn't get that. You know, dad came back from Vietnam and people looked down on him and I saw what it did to him you know I just through the years and the I dad was one of those that you couldn't even go up to dad and wake him up and shake him I did that one time I shook him to wake him up for something and he next thing you knew he had me against the wall by my neck and I had to remind him and be like it's me it's me Lil and, uh, you know, I ended up after that time, I had to wake him up like I would be at the door yelling, being, Dad, Dad, you got to get up. I couldn't get near him because, I mean, he was, you know, he was in the trenches. So and you can imagine what these soldiers are going through sleeping in the trenches, but they're really sleeping with one eye open because you never know. So I'm a big supporter of of helping these soldiers when they come home. We got to help each other. We got to help these soldiers and we got to, the VA is definitely, I'm one of those that the VA has got to do a much better job. I mean, my dad would, did not have a good experience at the VA at all when he got bladder cancer and he got, he got cancer with, by ancient orange too, that they determined, you know, when he was over there. And so I'm just really grateful though, that the soldiers, at least, you know, when you see them definitely say thank you for your service because that's so important. Uh, like I said, it's um, it, it just it's a moment to remember, and it's I know we get so caught up in our lives sometimes, and so caught up in our schedules, and so caught up in small things. It's just stupid sometimes the things that we get caught up in, and we got to remember, man, the the main thing to do is just be nice to each other, make time for each other, stop getting so. Ah, oh, just sweating the small stuff. It's as simple as that. Stop that. Just stop it. Cut it out and quit the whole holding grudges and all. And just remember that we're here. It is about love. That's exactly why at the end of the show, I always say much peace, love, and passion. Live with peace, love, and passion. Love what you do and and love each other. And, and it, I know it's it's simple, but for some reason, sometimes we just can't seem to do that. But remember, too, if somebody is out of line, replying with more hate does not help that person. If someone is out of line, you need to embrace them and you need to teach them why they need to be more loving or or giving or compassionate instead of just being angry with them. Anger does not. Anger, Anger with more anger gets us absolutely nowhere. But again, this show being dedicated to all those who lost their lives on 9-11 and to all the military people out there. And I think it's a perfect segue into who we have today. I mean, he went to Iraq, J.R. Martinez. He wanted to be a soldier. And he went to Iraq. And sure enough, you'll hear it coming up now in this the bio piece that we do, but to have your body burned to the degree that he was burned, like 34% of his body changed his entire looks, 
his outer exterior and how he had to deal with that and how he overcame that. What a powerful story it is, though, what he's done since, how he helps others. And I think that you guys are going to definitely get a whole – i that's my hope, but you're going to get a whole different perspective as to life and how to handle life on a daily basis. And like I said, quit focusing on the small things that really don't matter. So – Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today on Chasing Glory for our 9-11 special. And for now, here is J.R. Martinez's Journey of Chasing Glory. The term hero can be defined in many ways, but Jose Rene Martinez is the ultimate hero. Born in Louisiana to a single mother, J.R. Martinez loved playing sports and had aspirations to play in the NFL. Unfortunately, an injury ended his football dreams, and after his high school graduation, he decided to join the United States Army and was proud to serve as a way to give back to the country that has given him and his family so much. In March of 2003, JR was deployed to Iraq. Not even a month later, while driving a Humvee, the front left tire hit a roadside bomb and JR became trapped inside the vehicle where he suffered severe burns to 34% of his body. After being rescued and evacuated to a local medic station, he was transferred to the Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio, where he spent 34 months and underwent more than 30 plastic surgeries. After strong words of encouragement from his mother, JR decided he was not going to let a nearly tragic situation keep him down. During his recovery, he realized that he can have a positive impact on other patients with similar situations. And there, his journey of inspiration continued to grow on a daily basis. After becoming a motivational speaker, he added actor to his resume when in 2008, he joined the cast of ABC's All My Children and has gone on to be featured on other shows such as Army Wives and Safe. In 2011, he was named as one of the competitors for the 13th season of Dancing with the Stars. And after 10 ferocious weeks, he and his partner, Karina Smirnoff, won the prestigious Mirabal Trophy when they were named Season 13 Champions. Martinez wrote all about his courageous journey in his New York Times best-selling book, Full of Heart, My Story of Survival, Strength, and Spirit. Martinez has also dedicated his time to many nonprofit organizations, such as Operation Finally Home, as well as Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. As a veteran, he was awarded with a Combat Action Ribbon, as well as being presented with a Veterans Leadership Award, and he obtained his greatest accomplishment in 2012 when JR joined Fatherhood by helping bring into the world a beautiful daughter, Lauren Annabelle Martinez. It's about to get real, raw, and inspiring with JR Martinez. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Chasing Glory, J.R. Martinez. Oh my gosh, J.R., thank you so much for joining us. No, thanks you? for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. This is so exciting. I told my mom that uh, I was going to have you on here, and the first thing, she's like, oh, the dancing with the stars guy. I love it. <laughs> uh, we love moms. Oh, we yes. We love our moms. And I actually, what you know, there's been so many seasons of Dancing with the Stars. I kind of catch I some, and I don't catch others, depending on how my schedule is. And I caught your season. And you, nice. Yes, you really inspired me. Congratulations on winning. How was that whole journey for you? Oh man, it was um, it was exciting, it, it, and it was honestly a big uh, blurb um, at the same time. I mean, it, it, it's a well-oiled machine. I don't know if you've met anyone else that's ever been on the show, but yes. it, it's a well-oiled machine. And from the minute that you're um, you go into rehearsal and you're announced as part of the cast, um, it, they're moving 100 miles an hour. I mean, it's it's from you know your rehearsal, you know, all day long and and every single day to um, to then doing interviews, to doing fittings, to then doing camera blocking, and then of course the live show and everything that goes into preparing for that. So it 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 was, I mean, extremely exciting and probably one of the best experiences of my life. Um, but it also was one of those moments where you don't have time to really kind of process and enjoy, 
your accomplishment of the previous week because now it's like, well, you got to move on to prepare for the following week. And so there's really no time to process everything. It's just, it's just, all right, we did it. We survived. Now let's get ready for the following week. <laughs> yeah, you know, I actually got to see it from the other end because I got to go. I was supporting Stacey oh, nice. Keebler. Yeah, when Stacey Keebler was, I think she was like season three or something very early on. And, yeah, she did uh, great. Yeah, she sure did. And I got to be in the finale. Uh, I even got to sing the national anthem <laughs> before the whole cameras started. Like, it was just. Oh, that's cool. It was crazy. Yeah, but it was. Well, it's crazy to think that from the time that you went, whatever season that yeah. was that she was on, how much it had changed to the time I came on the show. And then from the time that I was on the show, the way the season is now, I mean, it's pr the production and what they roll out is, com I mean, I almost envy, I wish I was on the show now just oh, because really? it just seems so cooler and so much more. And, um, it, yeah, it's, it's, it was a great experience. Wow. I, I just want to know one question is how the heck did you memorize those steps in like just one week's time? You know, it's your, your your partner just beats it into your head. It's literally muscle memory. I mean, that's what it comes down to. It's like if you do anything for that many hours for five, six days straight, you're going to learn it. I mean, it's just it's, you're just going to learn it. Wow. It's just what happens, you yeah. know. Um, and honestly, I think a big part of it for me um, – is I had to kind of just allow myself to be vulnerable, to let go, you know, and, mm -hmm. and allow Karina to be the pro, you know, and, and trust what she said. And if she said, listen, just let go, don't overthink it, just try to relax and just pay attention to th these details, everything else will kind of fall into its place later. And, and I think that was one of the biggest things that – that really allowed me to 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 do well on the show is because I would see other cast members that were beating themselves up because they would mess up. And yet I would mess up and I'm like, all right, I got this. All right, let me go back and do it again mm. versus kind of getting stuck in my head and kind of playing, you know, playing with that voice. Great lesson. I feel like that's a great lesson for anything that it you is. do. Yeah, I think anytime you're outside of your comfort zone, I think, and I think this is the thing that works for me. And I think we've all had this, right? But for me in my life, I have been through so many situations to where I've been able to survive, right? I've been yeah. able to survive. I've been able to thrive through the adversity, come out on the other side. And so when I'm approached now with a new challenge, with a new task, I'm able to, instead of kind of buckling under that pressure, I'm able to kind of look back in my rearview mirror and realize, wait a minute, I've already done this. Like, not this exactly, but I've already been through adversity. I've already survived. I've already thrived. I already made it through. So this is just another one of those, you know, little barriers. And so I think all of us, what we should do, as much as people say, you know, don't look in your rearview mirror, don't look behind you, just look out the front of the car and look at where you're going. Yeah, but I think you need to look back from time mm -hmm. to time and, and kind of realize what you've already done, what you've been through. That's going to help you navigate wherever you're going as you're looking out to the front of the car, right? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I remember when I got put into the situation of ring announcing, and it was my very first day on the job, I find out that I'm ring announcing for WWE live on the wow. air worldwide, 140 countries, and I didn't even know how to do it because nobody had trained me. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> like, yeah. And then yeah. 10 minutes before I'm going live, I find out, or 20 minutes before I'm going live, I find out I can't even use cue cards. I almost ran, and then all of a sudden I had a flashback of being thrown into the swim team when I was nine years old without knowing how to swim. Yeah. And so when you it. say that, and I said, you know what? I survived, and I ended up being in the swim team for eight year or nine years and coached for two. So yeah. I, all of a sudden, I think it's very important to look back. When were you in those situations, you know, that you were thrown in? But speaking of looking back, so I want to – you know, we've we've touched on the story right before you came on, uh, you know, kind of just diving into what happened in that faithful day in April. And I just I really want to go back before we really go into detail about that, because it's important to see who you are as a person. Now, you actually were born in Louisiana, correct? Yeah. Yeah. But you actually say that your hometown or you feel your hometown is Georgia. Yeah. Milton. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, people are probably like witness protection plan. What, what the hell is going <laughs> on? But, <laughs> but, but you didn't get there till you were like 18 years old. Why, why is that feel like your hometown Dalton? 
Well, Dalton feels like my hometown because um, I was going into my senior year of high school and uh, from Louisiana, actually. I lived there for the first nine years of my life. And at the age of nine, we relocated to Hope, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And I lived there for about, you know, eight and a half, almost nine years and leading up to the end of my junior year of high school. And um, for the first nine years of my life in Louisiana, it was great. I mean, I loved it. I mean, my mother was a single mom, so it was just her and I, um, you know, everything seemed really peachy, you know, in my life. And. But the, but when we moved to Hope, Arkansas, you know, obviously now I'm kind of getting into those teenage years and I'm exposed to more and I'm kind of battling more and trying to find out who I am. And, and I just kind of felt out of place and I didn't feel like there was a lot of opportunity there. Um, unfortunately, not everyone in the community, of course, but, you know, it, it's kind of a, a, a it's somewhat an underprivileged community. I mean, it. it um, there's a lot of poverty. There's there's a lot of my peers necessarily didn't have dreams or ambitions. You know, it it just it just didn't seem like the right environment that I wanted to be in. And so I remember um, going to moving to Georgia right before my senior year, and it was actually because of me. Um, I had been nagging my mother by the time I was in high school if we can move, and because I didn't want to be in Hope and. And she, of course, would shoot it down and would always respond with, she's a single mom, she has a great job and hope, we can't relocate. So I would just suck it up and I would just li- I literally have to learn to adapt and just make it work. And um, at the end of my junior year, one of her friends um, asked her if, if she wanted to come for like a little vacation to, Dal- to Dalton, Georgia. Mm-hmm. So we went, you know, three, four day vacation. And um, on the drive back home, back to Arkansas, I remember asking my mother how what she felt about Dalton. And she was like, I loved it. And she just kept going on and on about how great it was. And I just thought this is the per- this is perfect because now mm. she's going she's gonna to be OK with moving. She's going to mm-hmm. be OK with relocating. And um, of course, I asked her the question if we can move. And she said no. And so. When we got home, I sat around and thought about, you know, kind of some plans and some ideas. And I proposed to my mother. I said, listen, why don't I go to Georgia for, let's say, two weeks? I try to get a job within those two weeks. If I don't get a job within those two weeks, then I'll come back to Arkansas and graduate from high school here. But if I get a job within those two weeks and if I happen to do well in a month from then, then you have to move to Georgia. I mean, it was very clear cut. There was no that. There was nothing tricky about it. Yeah. And she said, and she said deal. And so all we could afford at that time was for me to get on the Greyhound bus. And so I got on the Greyhound bus, went to Georgia, um, stayed with my mother's friend, got a job. The next day, I, you know, after I arrived, I got a job. And um, fast forward a month later, I secured enough money to um, – I made enough money to secure an apartment. So but the deal was my mother had to move, so she relocated. And just from the time that I arrived in Dalton and – you know, got into high school, you know, I started my senior year. It's just the way I was embraced in that community. Mm. Um, I, I was just embraced. I, I, I felt immediately that there was this kind of almost like this energy of where people, um, there was opportunity. It felt like there was life. It felt like there was um, just people per, trying to propel you to move forward and, and, and on to the next thing. And it was just my senior year was the best year of my high school years, and it was a, a credit to that community. And, of course, I don't want to get too far ahead, but after I was injured, the way that community embraced me, um, I mean, it literally was the foundation of how I've been able to be the person that I am today. Wow. And I love the fact that, you, you know, you're right there, you're sharing a lesson, follow your gut. Like something was really drawing you to there, and you followed it, and you made it yeah. happen. Yeah, I, I mean, here I was, an 18-year-old kid that really didn't know anything about life. I mean, I, yeah, I had had some adversity up until that point. I mean, and I always tell people, we could easily look at my military you know, service and, and, and that period of time and, and, and of course, my injury and kind of look at all the lessons that have come from that. But I always tell people, it's like, I think you have to go back further than that. Yes. You have to go back to my childhood. You have to go back to you know, the things that I was exposed to uh, unwillingly, uh, you know, and, and how I had to overcome with, to deal with a lot of adversity. My mother being a single mother, my mother, unfortunately, was abused by, you know, um, a, a couple of men in her life. Mm. Uh, I witnessed that. Uh, I, oh. I am one of those stories, unfortunately, of where you hear about kids or in the closet while, you know, the abuse is happening. Um, I am one of those kids that had to learn an, a quote unquote evacuation plan of 
How do we get out? What do we do when it starts to happen? And it was me go to the closet, grab the phone, call 911. Wow. That was that 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 was what that was what I had to deal with. And and unfortunately, there's a lot of kids that have to deal with that. And so, you know, but but th- that like you have to go back to that place Absolutely. as much as dark as that may be and and uncomfortable for a lot of people to acknowledge. Um, and I'm sure for my mother as well to kind of revisit those periods. But I mean, those things kind of helped me kind of become the person that I am today and in regard to a strong individual that is, is able to deal with any sort of kind of crisis and kind of get through it. Yeah, that's exactly why here at Chasing Glory, I always go back to those, you know, early years when I ask yeah. these questions, because it is true. I mean, I even look at my own, you know, childhood and I think about that and, and what it ended up that moment now helped me for this. And, you know, like I was saying before, but so how did you handle that with your mom and calling 911? And it, you said it happened a few times. Yeah, it happened a few times. I mean, it, it was, it, I mean, it was hard. I mean, I was, you know, I remember being one time, I think I was, I was nine years old. I think I just turned nine years old and, um, we came home from uh, a little gathering and my mom's, uh, boyfriend at the time, uh, had had been drinking way too much and came home and became, you know, just aggressive and, and loud. And uh, my mother told me she immediately looked at me and said, go in the house. And, and and I went in the house and I knew exactly what that meant. She didn't have to say anymore. And I went into the closet and I just remember hearing my mother like screaming because he was hitting her. Oh. And and I just it, it, it was an, it was enough. And my and, and this was a man that I had looked at as my father since my father, my biological father wasn't in my life. And so I remember writing out to him and, and kind of grabbing his arm and telling him to, you know, asking him to please stop hitting mom. And he turned around and hit me and, and you know, I fell to the ground. And, and, and that's one of the scariest moments that, 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 that we experienced in that period because he put us in a car and he, he drove around. And he told us that he was going to kill us. You oh, know what I mean? And, 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 and at that age, all you're thinking about is, one, you're angry. Yeah. Um, and I remember being angry with my mother as well. I mean, thinking, you know, you're... You, you're, you're kind of putting, obviously at that period in my life, I'm thinking you're putting us through this. Now I'm right. older. I'm like, you're putting yourself through this. Yeah. Um, I was angry. I was terrified. And, uh, the only thing that I, that I held dearly and I, I cared for dearly in my life was my relationship with my mother was my mother. And so to think that I possibly was on the verge of potentially losing that one thing, because that's what I heard. That's what he said to us. Um, it was, it was, it was scary. And, 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 Luckily, we were able to. He let us out. I called the cops. The cops came. He was arrested, and I just remember telling my mom, you know, one day at at that age, like, mom, like, we can't keep doing this. Like, this is not good. This is, you know, in my mm-hmm. own little nine year old voice. And um, and we at that point, that's when we relocated to Arkansas. My mother ended that relationship. It was over. And um, but but there was also other things. I mean, my mother. Um, you know, my mother is from Central America, El Salvador, and yeah. I remember as a young man going to El Salvador plenty of times. I mean, I went probably five times by the time I was in high school and being able to be exposed to the way of life outside of my little community in both Louisiana and Arkansas, um, seeing how in the United States criteria, we were kind of barely above the poverty line, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but in those, in my, in that country, El Salvador, I mean, we were the wealthiest individuals in the world. I mean, it just, we had so much, um, just from the simple fact that I was able to freely go to school. I mean, that's a complete luxury in a country like that, especially where my family lives. And, 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 you know, my mother worked at the graveyard shift. My mother was never home at night from around 10 o'clock in the evening till about eight o'clock in the morning. So I put myself to bed. I got myself up, you know, in the morning and got myself you know, ready for school and walk to the bus at nine years old. And, um, those things forced me to grow up. Those things forced me to be, to be very independent. Those things forced me to kind of say, I got this, I can do this. I don't necessarily need, you know, this person or that person or this person or that person to be holding my hand and get me through it. I've done this before. And so, and you can look at that in in a lot of ways and say, that's a good and a bad thing. I mean, now as an adult, and kind of having somewhat of a grasp of everything in my life, I realize it's a great thing, but it's also, it has its faults. I mean, to the point where I'm, I tend to be a little guarded when people want to come and assist me and help me. And I'm like, I don't need it. I'll do it myself. Ah, I got it. Totally you know? makes sense. Yeah. 
Totally. So it's like I, – because I, I never I never had any – I relied on my mother to provide shelter, to provide food, to provide you know comfort, um, to provide love. But in regards to kind of the day to day, like I kind of had it like from the ni- from nine years old. And um, so when it came to the point of me making a decision at the age of 18 to relocate and then convincing my mother to do it, that was not a big deal in a lot of ways. Like even now when I talk about it, I'm like, I just did it. You know, I just mm-hmm. felt it was the right thing to do. I, I had to change my environment if I wanted success. Um, but after what I just told you, everything else I experienced saying I'm going to kind of move, that was that was small compared to everything else that I'd been exposed yeah, to. Yeah, I, I can see that. And, you know, hearing that you didn't have a relationship with your father, some women, when they don't have a relationship with their father, they're then, later on, they kind of seek the approval of men all the time. Yeah. yeah. With you being a man that you didn't have a relationship with your father and then you did like with that her boyfriend, you <laughs> looked at him as your father and then he ended up beating up your mom and you're you're seeing that. Do you know like have you figured out in what way maybe that hurt um you know something in your life or your relationship, I don't know whether it's with other men or just your ability to trust. Well, uh, you know, I think I think The biggest thing that I've noticed is by the time I got into like I played sports growing up and I remember I really gravitated to to my coaches, Um, you know, my my football coaches, you know, basketball coach. I I really gravitated to them. Um, You know, they were kind of like those male figures that I kind of enjoyed being around and kind of cutting up with and them kind of calling me a knucklehead or (laughs) or, you know, you know, or, or giving me that tough love. Um, I remember gravitating to them. Um, but of course that's short lived. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I, I, after I left Arkansas, I haven't been back. I mean, I haven't been back since I left. I mean, I've been back to Arkansas, but I haven't been back to Hope, Arkansas, where I grew up. Mm-hmm. Um, Georgia, I've been back to, so I've been able to kind of develop a little bit more of a kind of an in-depth bond with my football coaches there. But I noticed it like when I joined the military, like I really gravitated to those men that, had been in the military, you know, were older than me. Um, I looked at them as big brothers. I really did. Mm. Um, some of them were old enough to where I looked at it like, you know, you could be my father. Like, and I really like gravitated to them. But I remember after I was injured, I developed this friendship with a guy named Dan, Dan Vargas. And uh, Dan is actually now my best friend. And um, he's 17 years older than me. Okay. He, you know, I'm 34 yeah. years old and he's 51. Um, you know, in, in, in the dynamic of our friendship, people are always confused because we're complete opposite. I mean, and just, I mean, the age alone, but then he's a big guy, six, four, you know, you know, just real chill, laid back, you know, I'm five, yeah. nine and I'm just like bouncing off of the walls when I walk in the room and, and he's <laughs> always like, calm down, man. And I'm always like, let's go it. And then I drag him into it and he's like, what are we doing? And, um, but I remember remember when I was battling, and I know we'll probably get into this a little bit later, but yeah. after I was injured, I started to deal with a lot of the in, the mental wounds, the internal wounds um, after my injury. And I remember one night being with him and some other guys, some other veterans in Indianapolis, and I, I, I was just angry. And I remember making a remark to somebody in the car, and Dan, who was driving, said to me, Jared, like, stop, like, leave him alone. Stop saying that. And I was so angry that I remember like just, I mean, just, just saying everything I possibly could at Dan. And I was just so angry. And, um, we had to, we had to pull over because somebody was getting out of the car. Like we were dropping them off. And I just remember getting out of the car and wanting to fight, wanting to fight Dan. Mm. I mean, this guy who was six foot four at that time, he was like 250, 60 pounds. I mean, the, the guy is huge. And you didn't care. And there was no way I had a chance, but I didn't care. There was so much rage and so much anger coming out of me. And, of course, he didn't do anything. But what he did is when we got back to our hotel, he said, sit in the passenger seat. And he sat me in the passenger seat, and he granted me permission to cry. Ah. He literally, he like he said, cry, man, cry. Let it out. Cry. You got something, and you cry. And I just remember crying in the car. And I, of course, we had a really big heart to heart. Now, before that moment, every time we ended a phone call, he would always say, I love you. And I would always just say, all right, talk to you later. Ah, yeah. Makes <laughs> now, sense. 
after that night, like after we had yeah. this heart to heart, he embraced me. After that night, every time he went to hang up and he said, I love you, I said, I love you too, man. Mm. And to this day, I'm able to say that because that was that was uncomfortable for me to be able to tell another man that I love him because there was no other man for me to tell I love you too when I was a child. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I had uncles, but they weren't in the picture consistently. They were in and they were out. And of course, the men my mother were with, my mother was with as as well. And so that was learned behavior. Now, now, you know, now I feel like now that we've kind of got past that place, like now, I don't know, I, I feel the absence of my father, now me being a father to a beautiful five-year-old, um, it, it, and I say this to people all the time, like without him being present, he taught me something valuable. And what it was, was to be present, was to be there, was to be involved. And so despite everything that has happened in, since the birth of my daughter, um, it's like the number one thing that had to always remain consistent was my presence in her life. Um, I couldn't let anything else get in the way of that. And so in a lot of ways, like my father taught me that lesson that despite whatever differences he had with my mother, he still could have had a presence in my life, but he refused to have that. And it affected me. Yeah. Yeah. I love, though, that you have not allowed that to affect your relationship with your daughter, because there's a lot of people that have those situations. And then the family tree of the same, you know, abuse or neglect or anything like that continues. And you stop that in your lineage and you did something and you changed that. So that's very admirable. And I'm sure your daughter, oh, my gosh, I mean, just when she grows up and really hears your story, she's going to appreciate that that much more. Yeah, it's 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 we're already seeing like little snippets of of, you know, of of of, of her almost being proud, you know, of, ah. of of daddy and what daddy's been through and, and, you know, kind of her ability to kind of understand everything and grasp it. We're already seeing little snippets of it to where. Um, she go, she'll be at the playground and she'll make a, you know, make some friends and immediately, suddenly she'll bring the friends over to me and, and, and she'll say, daddy, tell him about, tell him, tell him daddy. And I was like, tell him what, tell him that you that you were in the military and you, and you got burned in, in a truck. And, and I'm like, <laughs> when did I become show and tell? When did this turn into show and tell? Like the hell, like you're just right. playing and you bring a bunch of kids over with boogers in their nose and you want me to tell them about like, you know, something that, you know, and, and, and but then, and then she'll say, daddy, daddy, tell them, tell them about dancing with the stars, which mind you, she wasn't even born when I was right. on the show, but she, she's heard so many people come up to me and say, we loved you on the show. We, you know, yeah. that, that that she mocks that. And so she's really proud that a lot of people always come up. So she's always looking for ways for her to kind of start the conversation of like, daddy, tell him, hey, daddy, you're, and she always says to me, yeah, daddy, but you're really cool because you survived Aww. fire. Wow. Yeah. yeah that is yeah. amazing. Cool. Well, speaking of, I think that's a great uh, little intro to actually do share your story here with everybody who's listening to what happened to you. First of all, you joined the Army. Why the Army? Well, they were the only ones in the office um, at the recruiting station. I mean, that's, okay. <laughs> that's the truth. Okay. Um, the Air Force wasn't – they weren't there. Um, and, is that where your heart the, was, is the Air Force? Like if you – I, You know, I thought about it. I mean, the Air Force was kind of like what I really wanted to do. Like I was like, okay, I like the Air Force. It seemed cool. Like I didn't know much about it, but it was mm -hmm. like, okay, the Air Force. And, and I just remember trying to go and visit them at the recruiting station, and they weren't in the office. And now for those, <laughs> that, for those veterans listening right now, now and from all branches they know all branches tend to give each other a hard time honestly you know it because i'm sure yes. you know you've been to so many military bases and around so many veterans that you know that yes. we tend to give each other a hard oh, yeah. time <laughs> my dad started in the marines and then switched to the yeah. army so you can just imagine <laughs> yeah exactly it's just it's just ongoing and to people that aren't familiar with that they start to kind of look at us and be like, wait, you, you guys are actually on the same team, right? Like, yeah. you guys, you know, and, and yeah, we know we're on the same team, but right now we're not. But when we're in that environment, we are. Yeah. But um, I remember going to the Air Force. Like I said, they really weren't there. I went to the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps wanted me to do at least four years. And, and to me, I, that's not what I envisioned for my life. I, I wasn't ready to commit four years. What I wanted to commit was um, three years. That's what I was thinking. Mm. And so 
uh, and so then I went over to the army and the army said, yeah, you can do three years here. So I was like, perfect. Um, because I graduated high school in 2002, nine 11 happened just a few months before. And so I'm sure like a lot of people in this country, I was a young kid that was like, I want to do something. Um, uh, but I also felt the military would be an, an amazing opportunity for me to get a lot more discipline, get a lot more, I would get money for college. Um, I'd be able to serve. Um, I, it was a, it was a full package for me at that mm -hmm. time. It just made sense. Um, and so that's why I joined the army that they, they said, yeah, you could do three years. And I was like, I'm game. And they said, well, what do you want to do? These are the jobs you qualify for. And there was about five or six jobs that I would qualify for. And I was like, what's this thing called infantry? And he was like, well, and he explained it. And I said, I want to do that because I was 18 years old. And for those listening that don't know what infantry is, infantry is, is front lines. It's combat. I mean, you're, you're, you, mm -hmm. it, it's one of the most dangerous fields in the military. And I picked it because I just felt that if I was going to do this, I really wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to be all in. I didn't want to um, kind of half, half butt it. I don't know. Right. If I, but, I, you know. Um, well, you were I feeling just, did, it. Did 9-11, you know, we, here we are on the 9-11 anniversary and our 9-11 uh, special here on Chasing Glory. Did, did that affect you then in a way where you're like, okay, I have to serve my country? It did. And, you know, honestly, and this is some, to some people, this may sound like a stretch, uh, but it's not. I mean, this is, as I touched on earlier, my family is from Central America. My mother came here as an, as an immigrant, you know, and, and she worked hard and, you know, and, and I was able to be born here and, and, and thank God to look at all the opportunities that I had and look at what I've been able to do with my life um, since then. Um, but it affected 9-11 affected me in, in, in a completely maybe different way than maybe most. I remember being a senior in high school and wa looking up at the TVs and, and watching everything that was taking place. And, and, and once, of course, we all started to kind of really learn what was taking place. Um, I remember thinking to myself, like the opportunity that my mother sacrificed for me to have is now being put in jeopardy. Um, that if, if this country is under it, this country that has given so many opportunities to my mother to then therefore not only provide for me, that, but then provide for our family in El Salvador, um, it, it's being threatened. The mm -hmm. opportunity is being threatened. And I looked at it very personally. I looked at it like, because of course at that time, um, none of us knew if this was going to happen anywhere else. We didn't know if it was going to happen in your backyard. We knew New York. We knew D.C. We knew there was something in Pennsylvania that was happening. We didn't know if there was anything else that was going to transpire. And so at that time, I just remember feeling angry and just feeling like the freedom that, that, that me personally and my mother and those closest to me had um, was being put in jeopardy. So, yeah, I mean, it, 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 I was extremely grateful to, to this country because I had been exposed to the alternative, yeah. being raised, be, living in Central America. What would it be like to grow up there? And so I was extremely grateful for uh, what I had here in this country, even if I was, quote unquote, you know, somewhat poor. Like, I, I was extremely grateful for that. You're listening to Chasing Glory with Lillian Garcia. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the interview, but for now, let me just tell you something. When you're looking to buy a car, you want to make sure that you're getting a real pricing on actual inventory. That's right. Unfortunately, a lot of times, this isn't the case. People configure cars online only later to find out that they're not available. Can't find them. But with True Car, you can get real pricing on actual inventory. This is not pricing offered by True Car, but pricing from an actual dealer. And not just any dealer, but a True Car certified dealer. Now, this is carefully curated network of dealers committed to transparency and offering you a competitive market price. Using True Car, you can easily find a car that you want. Next, True Car will show you what other people in your area paid for the same car you're looking for. Now you know what a fair price is, so you can feel confident. Over 3 million cars have sold to True Car users by the True Car Certified Dealer Network. In fact, there's over 13,000 
True Car certified dealers nationwide. That can make you feel really good. You will work directly with a True Car certified dealer contact. True Car users are more likely to enjoy a faster buying process when they connect with a True Car certified dealer because there's nothing worse than being there and not knowing what to expect and what you're going to get. So True Car users save an average of over $3,000 off MSRP. Once you register, you'll get a real price on actual inventory. This is competitive pricing offered to you only by a True Car certified dealer for an actual vehicle on their lot. It's pricing you'll see before going to a dealership so you can feel confident when you show up. True Car shows their customers all of their available incentives before they arrive at the dealership. That is so nice. So when you're ready to buy a car, visit True Car to enjoy a more confident car buying experience. Some features not available in all states. Now back to Chasing Glory with Lillian Garcia. So you enroll, you actually trained in Fort Benning, which my father trained there too. It's so yeah. wild to, to like the comparisons, you know? It's like <laughs> my dad's ghost was there when you were there. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I mean, it's, 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 it's when, I got, when I got to basic training in you know, Fort Benning, Georgia, I just remember learning, you know, within the first, I think, a few days or so of being there, you kind of hear about the history and hear how long it's been around and how many people have trained there. And and you really start to I mean it's like going through a museum you know you're just yeah. like wow I'm, I'm really walking amongst history right now mm-hmm. and your father was one of those individuals and I mean for me I love when I have the opportunity to meet you know those that have served prior to me because it just um, that's history I'm shaking history's hand no different than maybe in 20 years from now someone will shake my hand and say wow that's you're part of history yeah. you know you're part of an era in, in our country that. Um, you know, it was so crucial. And so, um, yeah, it, it, for me, anytime I get an opportunity to be in any military facility um, or a museum, I just, I, I'm just, I, I try to really be as present as I possibly can. That is absolutely the same exact way that I feel because I was born on a military base. And so yeah. I was around military all my life. I would sit in, in the front lawn and I would watch them training and you know, marching and with the songs and I would learn the little songs and, the and yeah. yeah. So when I, when WWE went to Iraq and Afghanistan and they asked me to go, I was like, Oh my God, this is amazing. I totally want to go. And it there was like was. full circle for you. Yeah, it was full circle. And so when I landed it now, you know, was around everybody, all these soldiers, I'm like, oh, I'm home. It, you know, it just felt like not the city, not the country, but just being around the soldiers felt like being at home. So I can imagine that's exactly when you see somebody, you walk, you know, by somebody is in a, a soldier in uniform, you feel that way. Right, right. Absolutely. I completely do. Um, you know, I, I I was recently in, in D.C., had the um, had a work event there and a speaking engagement. Um, and I'm currently... Uh, my girlfriend and I were training for uh, a half marathon oh, here in New York, and nice. uh, so I had to. We had to go do our long run. It was our long run day on Sunday, and so um, you know we were staying close to the National Mall, and so we 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 I took a run down the National Mall. We I think we had to do like six or seven miles. I forget what it was that day, and 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 I I I was like I'm going to the cemetery. I'm going to Arlington. I'm going to run over the bridge, and I'm going to go there and. And I just remember just kind of running not only through the National Mall and kind of seeing all the monuments and just the history of, of this this country's history, but then running, you know, to Arlington Cemetery and just, um, you know, obviously personally for me to think that I almost I, I almost was one of the individuals in that cemetery. <sighs> yeah. Um, but then to think that, but then on the on on the flip side of it, then start thinking about perspective of like I'm not. Thank God. But I'm I'm here and I'm able to run and I'm able to you know to, to 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 do what I'm doing right now literally go for a run and it just made me that much more grateful and I just felt at home and I felt at peace and I just felt um, just just indebted to those all the men and women that have served before me those giving the ultimate sacrifice those that have just passed away you know from whatever it may be and just mm-hmm. um, you know it's 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 
we, you know, when it comes to our military, it, 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 they're like nurses and doctors and first responders. And, you know, like people don't realize that they're, that, that, that they're there because we're too busy living our lives. Um, it's like right now, you know, what the rebuilding that is still taking place in, in, in Houston and yeah. the surrounding areas. I mean, people don't realize that all these organizations and all these individuals are there. They're training, they're preparing, and when that moment comes that you need someone, they're there. Mm-hmm. And it's just it, – it's that's our military. You know, they're there. They're, they're, they're not sitting at home right now just kind of kick their feet up. They're training. They're preparing, you know, for the next – unfortunate moment that our country needs us and um whether that be abroad or, or stateside we're here and, and and i think that was that was what was tough for me lillian is is i i joined i was in basic training for three months i immediately fell in love with this camaraderie this this brotherhood yeah but then we, we're immediately broken up like like the unit is broken up because everyone gets stationed somewhere you know different and when I got to my unit in January of 2003, which was the 101st out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky, uh, about 40 minutes outside of Nashville, Tennessee, I was 19 years old. And I remember getting there and immediately developing a bond with a lot of the guys, like looking up at these guys. And, um, and, and, and very quickly, I started to kind of change my thought process and thinking – well, maybe this isn't just going to be three years for me. I think I'd want to do this for the rest of my life. That's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just do this because what I fell in love with is I fell in love with service. Yeah. Service had become, was becoming my identity in the midst of me being a young man and trying to find my identity and create my identity. Service was a part of that mold of where, this is what I want to be a part of for the rest of my life. And it's wild because I see it now that after your accident, you have been in a different type of service, but you're still serving because you're helping those that also have had the unfortunate situation of being injured and don't know how to handle it. Yeah. Take us through what happened that day, uh, April 5th, and... You know, how are you overcame that? Uh, Well, the 5th of April of 2003, I was um, driving a Humvee through a city called Karbala, just south of Baghdad. And um, uh, we were escorting the convoy. We got them to their destination safely. We started to turn around to go back to our base camp. And they told us that we had to pull over. We had to meet up with because we have a new mission um, and it was we had to meet up with a group of guys just north of the city of Karbala. But we had to pull over first because we had to find a safe route, you know, to take in order to get to those those individuals. Now, mind you, this was about, you know, not even a month after the war actually started in Iraq. So, you know, things were still very hot and still very new. And, um, you know, after a couple of hours, they finally came to us and said, all right, men, we have our route. Everyone get in your Humvees. And I just remember getting in the Humvee. I was the driver. There was a passenger. There was a guy sitting behind him. And then there was a guy manning the the weapon on top of the Humvee, which is a gunner. And I just, um, you know, I started the drive. Um, and, and, you know, I always tell people when you're away from freedom, family, and friends, what fills the void uh, is humor. Humor comes into play. And you yeah. just kind of laugh and distract your mind a little bit from kind of what you're seeing, what you're doing, what you're exposed to. Um and we were just cutting up, you know, just kind of passing the time, cutting up, not thinking anything's going to happen. And suddenly, boom, what happened was the front left tire, the Humvee that I was driving, ran over a roadside bomb, which is pretty much right under my feet. Mm-hmm. Um, or, you know, not directly, but pretty close, you mm-hmm. know, to, to, to closer to me than in all the other guys. And um, I was trapped inside of the vehicle. The other men were thrown out of the vehicle. Um, they all walked away with minor physical injuries, but I was trapped inside of the Humvee. And um, for five minutes, I mean, I just kind of had this, I had this for five minutes, just this, um, oh man, I don't even know how to describe it, but I just had for five minutes, this kind of this, the, the play of events that was kind of taking place in my head where I would think about my mother's worst fear becoming a reality. I would think about the, the fact that I'm 19 and I'm going to lose my life in this way. I would think about all the things that I wanted to do and I wasn't going to get to do. Um, and then my eyes would start to get really heavy and they would start to close. And I would just, I remember thinking, 
I can't close my eyes because if I close my eyes, that's it. I've given up. Um, I got to keep my eyes open. And so I would fight to keep my eyes open um, and, you know, just think I got to hold on. Um, and, and, and I would start screaming and, and for someone to help and please come pull me out. And in between every single scream, it was a, a gasp for air because I had, um, internal injuries. I had a lacerated liver, I had broken ribs, so I couldn't get air into my lungs. And in the mix of me trying to get oxygen, I was not realizing it at the time. Of course, it was just survival mode for me, but I was inhaling all of the smoke from the fire, wow. which did a lot of dam damage to my insides. And so um, after five minutes, two of my sergeants reached in, pulled me out. I was immediately medevaced. I went to a local medic station set up in Iraq. And that's when the doctors made the, uh, the executive call to put me in a medical induced coma. Um, one, because I was, my body was going through shock. So I was I wasn't allowing the doctors and nurses to do what they needed to do because my body was going through shock. So I was kind of fighting everyone. Yeah. Um, and then they just said, he's, he's going to need this energy. If he survives, he'll need this. So I was put in the coma. From there, I was taken to Longstuhl, Germany, which is where a lot of veterans, you know, it's their first stop, you know, before they, mm -hmm. uh, it's their next stop before they, or the last stop before they come back to the States. Um, I was there for three days and then I was put on the plane and brought back to the United States and I was taken to San Antonio, Texas to the burn center for the military, which is in San Antonio. And, um, I just remember getting there at, you know, uh, three weeks, uh, after I was injured, I wake up at, a, you know, to a voice of a man and he's telling me that, you know, that I, I'm no longer going to be able to be in the military. He's telling me that what I'm seeing in the mirror is what's going to be, um, but he's telling me it's all going to be okay. And, and he's telling me like, I can't go back and, and, and be with my guy. Like, and so as you can imagine, not process. only did I lose my identity that I had known for 19 years of my life, yeah. meaning the identity that I looked in the mirror and saw every day, but I also lost the identity that I was starting to create for myself, which is being a soldier right. um, and being of service. And so, as you can imagine, I mean, I fell into a completely negative place and, um, uh, and I was stripped of everything in, in, in that moment um, and just felt completely helpless. Uh, I can't even imagine. Like, it's so, something that, you know, only you know exactly how, you know, what you went through. Uh, we can only try to guess, but it is incredible to know that and then to know you came out of it. And I have heard that your sister came to you. Now, your sister had yeah. passed, Annabelle. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So when, when And you when, never when... met Annabelle. Let me just, uh, like, fill people in. Uh, she and your other sister, uh, is it Consuela? Consuelo, yeah. Oh, Consuelo. Consuelo. Um, they both stayed in El Salvador. Mm -hmm. Now, did, yeah, that... and you never got to meet them. No, well, I never, I never got to meet Annabelle. So I went to El Salvador for the first time when I was six years old. Um, but Consuelo, who was the oldest, Annabelle was this, was the middle child, and I was the last. Um, but when when I was three years old, Annabelle had passed away um, from an illness that she was born with. Mm. And, um, so I never got to meet her, um, uh, you know, before she passed because, you know, I didn't go to El Salvador, to El Salvador for the first time since I was six. Mm -hmm. Now just kind of go through the story real quick for you. But the second time I went to El Salvador, I was nine years old. And that was the, the, the time my mother actually took me to my, to Annabelle's burial site to her grave. And, and I just remember standing there and there was just this, this emotion that just came over me and I can't explain it. It was just this emotion that I felt that, um, I just, I just like, I was grieving yeah. her passing, but I never met her. And so it was just so confusing to me first and foremost, of course, to my mother and to my family of like why I was crying, um, so much when I never met her. And, um, I just remember, you know, that moment. And so I was nine years old. I came home, kind of forgot about it. Now, fast forward, 19 years old, trapped in the Humvee, thinking I'm going to die. And suddenly, in the mix of all the chaos and noise of, of me screaming, of, of the fire, of, of everything, um, suddenly there's this kind of peacefulness that comes into play. And my sister, Annabelle, the one who passed away when I was mm -hmm. three, 
appears to me in the only form that I had ever seen her, and there's a picture my mother has, appears to me, and I know it's her, and suddenly everything goes silent except her. And she says to me that I'm going to be fine. Wow. And then it's like the minute, like the minute, like she, her image kind of faded away. It seemed like not even a second afterwards as I was pulled out of the Humvee. Wow. You know, and so of course, you know, fast forward to about a month after that, I'm in the hospital. I'm, I'm kind of telling my mother about everything in detail, what I experienced. And then I bring this up. And as you can imagine, as, as, as a parent who has lost a child, to hear something like this and to, 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 to hear that your child you lost is still with you. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was extremely emotional for her, but it was this, it was this beautiful story. And I just, I just, and there's kind of been these amazing things that have kind of transpired over the course since my injury, where things have happened, like really amazing things have happened either on or around my sister's birthday, Annabelle's birthday. And so, um, I've always, I still feel, I believe that she is my guardian angel. I feel that she's with me. I feel that she's with us. Um, and, and yeah, it, it, it's truly an amazing story. A powerful, so powerful. Yeah. I always tell people that, you know, when, when somebody passes, it really isn't the end. They are with you. If I, you I look for that, it, yeah. you know, the signs will show up if you're open to them. That's what I'm, I tell people. I, I tell people that all the time. And I just tell them, I say, I'm not the one to mess with, man, because if I pass, I will, I am... <laughs> I'm I'm this guy. I'll come back and try to get you. I will. I don't. I don't let go of grudges, man. I will come back and haunt you. Like I will come back and mess with you. Like that's the type of person that I am. I'm not proud of it. It's just who I am. Like yeah. So don't don't mess with me because right. you never know. <laughs> I'm gonna make sure I stay on your good side. That's yeah. for sure. <laughs> wow. Well, I, what do you attribute to then being able the biggest thing to to get through that? I mean, you had like 34 different surgeries. In a course of what, eleven years? Yeah, um, and I've, it's been—I mean, how long? I'm doing the math in my head now. It's been fourteen years. Yeah, fourteen years since my injury, and so, um, yeah. I mean, I've—I've I, I've had my fair share of surgeries. Honestly, my daughter was asking me the the other day, "How many surgeries have you had?" And I had to like stop and really think about it because at some point you just stop counting. It's, yeah. It, early on in the process, you count because it's like it's really cool, right? Like, right. It's to say like you've had this many surgeries, but at some point it's like it's just like okay, another it's one. Not Here cool we go. Anymore. Just do it. Get it over with. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, as far as what do I attribute kind of me coming out on the other side? I mean, I think there's not just one thing, you know, it's kind of like those infomercials that all of us kind of watch and we get hooked in late at night when we can't sleep. And, you know, you, you see whatever the product is and you're like, you get really excited about it. But then the, you know, almost all of them will say, you know, well, you have to make it's, it's several payments, several installments of. 1999, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and, and, and that's life. You like, you don't just make one choice in life. One choice takes you to another place, but then it takes you to that place. And then there you have to make another choice, which is another installment. You have to make another payment. You don't just have one, one, one moment of life of adversity. Guess what? You're going to have another moment where you're going to face a lot of adversity. I mean, and so on. I mean, that's just the way life is. Um, and so there wasn't just one thing for me. It was a multitude of things. I think early on, the biggest thing that really kind of allowed me to see the, the, the light was in the mix of me just kind of going through the motions, not really knowing what purpose I had, what I was going to do with my life. I was asked to visit a patient who had just arrived at the hospital and was having a hard time because he had seen his face. He had seen how bad it, it was. And he was told the same exact thing that I was told six months prior. And... I walked into his room and I started to talk to him. And about 45 minutes later, I told him that I would come back the following day and check on him. And I remember coming back the following day um, and and just noticing that he had a – I mean his outlook was was drastically different. Mm. He had like this positive outlook. And what I did is I asked the the – the um the doctor the head of the, the 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 ward and I asked him if I can visit patients every single day and he said of course and so I started visiting patients every single day in between my own appointments and that turned into I mean that turned into um 
literally my purpose. That became yeah. what I was going to do with my life. And every day I scheduled my, my personal appointments in the morning. So I would leave the afternoon and the evening free for me to visit all of these guys. And um, then I got involved in a nonprofit that was helping veterans and, and helping them with the transition. Then um, I, people started to see me on, on shows and say, hey, we'd, that kid that we saw, we'd love for him to come and speak. And, um, and, and what kind of speaking? Well, motivational speaking. And I just remember thinking I was 20 at the time, and I was like, I don't want to do that. And the person that was presenting it to me, they said, well, why don't you want to do that? And I said, well, because girls don't like motivational speakers. <laughs> um, I, yeah, you always I was, had a thing for the girls. <laughs> I, was, I was 20. You know, let me just, yeah. let me just let's say that. I was 20. Right. And, and, and when I think about that comment now, you know, at the age of 34, I think about that comment. I think about it. It makes sense why I said that because I was still, I was still very insecure. Mm-hmm. I was still very fresh as far as like my wounds, my facial wounds. Um, I had already kind of dealt with, you know, girls and people in general in public just staring at me and then just not approaching me. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, of course, I felt the only way I was ever going to have a companion, a partner, um, would literally be I would have to have a cool job. <laughs> um, and speaking wasn't going to get me the girl of my dreams. Like that was my thought process. Totally makes sense. And and they kept nagging for me to try it. And I was like, fine, I'll try it. You know, kind of like what you do with your parents, or, you know, yeah. or, or you know, just leave me alone. Fine, I'll do it. Okay. And I just remember doing it. And then I, all the, all of these people came up to me afterwards and shared all this amazing feedback. And I just thought, wow, like I can have an impact. Mm-hmm. And so I set out to be a motivational speaker in between my own, you know, recovery process and when I got out of the army, I was 22 years old. Um, in 2006, I was 22. I had a story. I felt I knew how to tell it, and I honestly, you know, thought everybody was going to be calling me um, to book me. But it didn't happen that way. I mean, it was. I mean, people judged me. I mean, people. Yeah. When I would tell them I'm a veteran, this is my experience, you know, was or is, and I want to come and speak, and they would, all of them would say to me. You're just a veteran. All you're going to do is talk about war. Wow. Ouch. That's what they would say to me. And as you can imagine, like as someone who felt that I was I was okay at it, you know, I felt yeah. I had a lot to share. And I was an example of proof of, of, of being a survivor and being told that. I mean, I just it was a punch in the gut. And that is what ultimately started to kind of send me kind of on a spiral downward where I started to kind of become angry, you know, and 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 and. and in that period of my life when I talked about earlier when Dan and I had that moment. Yeah. Um, I mean, to the point where I was like, forget this speaking thing. I'm going to give it up. It's ridiculous. I can't believe I even thought about this. I'll have to think of something else I'm going to do with my life. And I had that moment with Dan, you know, and that moment kind of kept me afloat. Um, and I just, I, you know, the only thing I can really tell you, because from the time that I was injured to the time where I kind of felt things turned around for me was five years Mm -hmm. and 2008 is when things really started to kind of turn around for me that's when I got the opportunity to be on the soap opera on my children but before that the one thing I can just tell people that I just did is because trust me I had many moments hell I still have moments to this day but I had many moments in that five-year window where I would be so angry and caught up in my own head and I would have a uh, I mean I would be so angry and cry and just kind of clench my teeth in my room and just anger of, mm-hmm. of everything that I had to deal with. But then I would be like, okay, it's over. Now I'm going to walk out of my room and I'm going to smile. Like I, it was just, it, you can call me like this hopeless romantic about life. But I mean, that's kind of what I just, it's the only thing I had to bank on was just something good has to come. Like this yeah. can't be it. And that's kind of that. what I just relied on. And that got me through. Yeah. I mean, I can totally hear it. And I, I love that because that is a, a great lesson there. And I, it reminds me of, I, I'm not sure if you know her or not, Lindsay Sterling. She's yeah. a violinist player. Yes. And yeah. uh, she's really good. And during her concert, she was talking about how she suffered from depression. And one day it hit her that the hours and hours and hours that she was spending in rehearsing her violin and her dancing, because she dances while she plays violin. Uh, For those of you who haven't seen her, she's incredible. You could uh, YouTube her videos. But she said how she had to practice being happy. 
so she could get herself out of it. And she realized that that's what she had to do. And so every day she would force a smile. She would force herself to not feeling depressed and having good thoughts and putting, you know, good positive things around you and hanging out with positive people. And (laughs) and she said, I I ended up training myself like I did with violin. I tell people like all the time because people people will come up to me and say, wow, like it's amazing. You know, I'm like, listen, and and sometimes like when I do like book signings, um, I'll, I'll write a people's book and I'll write. You got to practice positivity daily. Mm-hmm. It's it's something you must practice. It, it's l- exactly what Lindsay said. Um, it, you have to practice positivity. It, it's almost like if you find someone that is just kind of born with this amazing positivity and never almost like shows that they have a real moment, then you 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 want nothing to do with that person. It's it's almost like Mickey Mouse. Like you go yeah. to Mickey Mouse as much as we all love Disney, and you go to and Mickey's always oh hello everything's <laughs> great everything's fantastic wow great and, voice <laughs> and, and me as a positive person I just want to hit him and be like oh have you ever been through anything in life Mickey you know yeah. and it's just like. No one really is like that no, unless they've already been through something and taught themselves that. You know what I mean? Right. And and it's okay to also show vulnerability. What I do want to ask you before we wrap up, uh, I could talk to you forever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I want to ask you, with with so much focus on looks, and uh, what would you say to those people, mostly women, as you know, that they're putting so much emphasis on their looks and they're scared of losing their youth, so scared of wrinkles, so scared of all of that. I mean, you've you've touched on something now. I mean, you've gone through it, how you used to be all about looks and getting the ladies. Yeah. What would you say to those people? I I, I would just say it, it, it's time for you to em- it's time for you to embrace, to hug um, to, uh, just, just cradle who you are, um, what you are, you know, just, just embrace it and, and just own it because, you know, eventually as we all have heard that fate, you know, what remains is who you are as a person and, and believe it or not, who you are on the inside. I mean, it overshadows what you are on the outside. I mean, it, it, it your personality, your, everything about you, um, it comes out, you know, and, and, and so for me, when I got to a point where I just kind of said, hey, this is who I am. <laughs> yeah, I know that there's going to be at that period of my life, there's going to be some people that are not going to want to be around me. There's going to be some people that are not going to want to be seen in, 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 in my presence or not going to. I, I know that I, I saw it. I, I experienced it. I just kind of developed. I don't give it. I, I just don't yeah. like this is who I am. This is what I am. And I'm cool with it, and I just embrace who I am. And so you just can't worry about trying to kind of freeze time. You know, you can't worry about trying to impress the next person. It's like just be you, and that right person will fi- will, will will see your light and will come to you, and it will all be freaking merry. Like I mean, it's it's just 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 own it. Just just embrace who you are, embrace what's happened to you, embrace whatever scar, embrace whatever image that you have, and just let it be part of the character and part of the growth and part of the strength that 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 you have. I mean, you know, and, and trying to cover it up um, or trying to like be what you were before, it's like you're just constantly going to be spinning your wheels and stuck in this one place. Yeah. And it's great words to live by because I constantly see, like I said, especially women and plastic surgery and all of that, just they keep on. And the thing is, is they'll do something and then five seconds later, they're dissecting their faces so much. They're like, oh, what if I do this? And what if I yeah. do that? And and I'm going, oh, my gosh, so much emphasis on the outside. People don't work okay. enough on the inside and know that I mean, that's real. That's the real beauty. It's it's it's. I'm, I'm, I mean, one of the things that we do with our daughter is is we we always we always ask her. You know, we we always ask her like, um, you know, is it better to be smart or beautiful? And she says to be smart. And you know, and you know, everyone always compliments her and compliments us and say you have a beautiful daughter. And we're like, we know, we, we believe she's a beautiful she's a beautiful girl. But we want her to grow up and think about personality is everything Mm -hmm. you know brains is everything the beauty is there and 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 it'll show in a completely different way when you maybe start to kind of lose it on the exterior you know like and so like we're we're instilling that in her 
at a very young age for her to think about things differently because I don't want her to grow up that way. Like I want her to be able to say, you know what? I have this sense of humor. I have a personality. I'm smart. That those are the things that that outweigh, you know, looks in many ways. Yeah. And being a good person. Right. And being a good person. Exactly. Be caring and and be of service to other people and and, um, knowing that you can be of service to someone else. You can do something for someone else. And uh, it's not taking so much out of your day to try to do something for somebody else every single day. Do one little act of kindness. Mm -hmm. Um, Pay attention to who opened the door for you. You know, at, at next time you go to Starbucks, you know, it yeah. just magically open. Somebody held the door open. Yeah, for say you. thank it, you. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> simple. Oh, and speaking of Starbucks, can you guys just clean up uh, after yourselves? Like when you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> mix the coffee and all that. I go there and all of a sudden there's just like coffee dripping all over the place. People just walk. I'm like, what is this? So I, I, I learned something a long time ago. It said, leave a place better than what you found it. So. Mm-hmm. If you even didn't, if you get there and you see it's messy and you didn't even do it yourself, just clean it up anyway. It'll make the next person uh, feel better. Well, I can't thank you enough for – you've been of service today. You know, you – sharing your story, being this open. I'm so happy, by the way, that uh, you and Diana got back together because the last that I had heard, it was like, I don't know, 2014. You guys had split up and then you worked it out. I love that. We we, we grew up. We grew up. You know, that's what that I tell people all the time. It's relationships. I've been married. It's it's not easy, but when you work through it, what you get on the other side is so amazing. It is, and I think that was the biggest thing for us. And obviously, now our lives are just fuller than they have ever have been. Um, you know, but but that's exactly what it is. Is I, as I think us under us really listening to each other first and foremost, because mm-hmm. um, I think we spend a lot of time hearing each other but not listening to each other. Oh, good point. And then. And then also validating each other, you know, validating each other's feelings, whether we agree with them or not. But we had to validate that that's that those are your feelings currently in this moment. That's the way I made you feel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just saying, I'm sorry, that wasn't my intention. And or let's walk. Let's talk it out. Let's let's work through that. Um, and, and so I think it, you're right as far as what you said. Like, I mean, us being able to do that now, what we are receiving because of 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 all the work we've put in i mean is it's 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 just you can't put a name to it you can't put a price on it um all the blessings that have kind of come that have come our ways you know since we have kind of now ventured onto where we always felt we should have been yeah Uh, but things got in the way you know but luckily we stayed true to each other and we stayed true to who we always wanted to be and what we felt we could be and um and not only are we being able to enjoy that, but our daughter is able to yeah, enjoy absolutely. that. Absolutely! Oh my gosh! Absolutely! Yeah. More than anything, she is definitely now growing up with parents that are teaching her, you know, how to overcome things. Yeah, you don't give up. You don't give right. up. There's always something to fight for. And yeah. if you really want it bad enough, you know, you have to fight. And, you, and then if you don't fight, you can't complain to everyone that it didn't come to you because you know what? You had a moment. And you just had to fight. But if you're not mm-hmm. willing to fight. Then don't sit here and 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 and, and cry wolf that it didn't happen to, for right. you. Right. Well, great words to end by. Thank you so much. You no, are thank you. New York Times bestseller, full of heart, my story of survival, strength, and spirit. You heard it here, uh, and amazing. And you're you're still the spokesperson for Operation Family Home. Uh, Operation Finally Home. Yeah. Finally Operation Home. Finally Home. Um, yeah. I. I that's that's a way where I continue to serve and be of service is being involved in, in philanthropy. So uh, you can go to my website, GerardMartinez.com, and just learn about the different organizations that I'm involved in. I love that. And on social media, how do we find you? Well, on Instagram and, and Twitter, uh, I am I am Jr. Martinez, and Facebook is uh, it's just Jr. Martinez. All right. Well, can't thank you enough again, and good luck to you. I can't Thank wait to you see so your much. next adventures, and I really want to be in the audience when you give one of those uh, motivational speaking engagements because Absolutely. you are so inspirational. Uh, well, thank you so much, and um, I, I think I have to say this. I want to thank um, you and your family for your service as well because it's not just your mm-hmm. father that served. It was you. It was your mother. It, oh, you have siblings. You. It, it, it's a family that served, so thank you as well. Thank you so much. I appreciate that a lot. 
All right. right. Take care. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Wow, JR. Gosh, I can't thank you enough. I mean, what a story. What a man. Did you guys not just seem that that is just what we all needed? Sometimes we need that. We just need a little dose of reality. Again, at the beginning of the show, I know I got emotional, but I, I and I'm not scared to show emotion. I think we have to. It, everything can ju- cannot just be rosy all the time. And Jr. is the definite proof of that, that things were not rosy for him during those dark times. But he has turned that into something. There is a silver lining to everything everything and he has found his silver lining he's helping so many people and i it's just brilliant what he's doing and i can't applaud it enough so thank you jr for for sharing that amazing story and thank you guys for joining us here on chasing glory remember we're definitely going to be playing the national anthem from 913 it was Two days after 9-11, back 16 years ago, we're going to end the show with that. Uh, first, I just want to remind you guys to make sure you follow me on Instagram and on Twitter, at Lillian Garcia. On Facebook, it's Lillian Garcia Official Fan Page. Make sure that you subscribe at Apple Podcasts. It helps us so much. We definitely want to get the show out there. PodcastOne.com and also the brand new Podcast One app. Please rate and give us five stars please, and review Chasing Glory on Apple Podcast as well. And for now, just make sure, guys, like I say all the time, much peace, love, and passion. And remember, like JR even reiterated, always be yourself and trust that it's enough. Now, here is my performance from two days after 9-11, 16 years ago. We thank you again to all those in the military that love to just keep us safe and are so strong. Much respect. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the singing of our national anthem. Oh, can you see by the dawn's early light what to pray Twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars Through the perilous fight Oh, the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly streaming And the rockets ran for the 